Bubble Laser is a professional freelance artist who specializes in D&D. Do you want to see your character brought to life by a crazy talented artist? How about printable custom character sheets complete with the visage of your PC, or custom tokens of your character for your virtual tabletop games? What about immortalizing your adventuring party with an epic piece of artwork? Of course you do, so go get your art commissioned by Bubble Laser. Bubble Laser is the official artist of the characters of Super Quest Saga, and Will, myself, your special guest Jake, and friend of the show Josh Freeland all play with her magnificently designed custom character sheets while we're recording. You can reach her at BubbleLaser.com, Facebook, Instagram, or on Fiverr.com. Just search for Bubble Laser. That's Bubble Laser, one word, and laser's got a Z. Hey everybody, welcome to the Dungeon Cast. I'm Brian. And I'm Will. This is the podcast where we talk about everything Dungeons and Dragons, from the thickest thickets to thirsty Thrycreens. And today we're talking about Thoris Dune. Hey, Brian. Hey, Will. How you doing today? We're back at it again. I'm doing just fine. I'm ready to talk <laughs> about Dungeons & Dragons lore, and I'm looking at the notes for Thayer's Dune, and it seems like you're excited to do I this. Am, I am very excited to do this uh, this topic. Now, I believe the um, the canonical pronunciation is there is done, but there I've done. never heard someone say there is done because it sounds stupid. <laughs> Everyone says there is Dune. Yeah, but we're going to hear about it no matter how we say it. Exactly. So I'm saying there is Dune, just like you said earlier. There are literally episodes where I change the pronunciation as we talk about it, <laughs> and people are mad about the way I said it the first time, and yeah. then people are mad about it the way I said it the second yeah, time. There's no winning, but let's get into it. So today we are covering one of my favorite evil deities, and one that isn't too widely discussed. This is mostly because not much is written about him, which is partly due to that very fact being part of this deity's mythos. He's established as a secret and forgotten god, and also partly because although Thurus Dune was created by Gary Gygax in first edition for the Greyhawk setting, there's little real addition to his mythos slash lore all the way up until fourth edition, which as 4E does, likes to uh, establish and uh, really, really define things that are not very well defined before. And Fourth it really, edition is the teenager of the Dungeons and Dragons editions. I don't I'm know. Not, I'm not going to listen to you, mom. Uh, yeah, do what I want. Def- definitely that. But also, like, uh, I love. I just love how Forey likes to really detail things, while every other edition is super vague about everything. That's true. Um, but yeah, Forey really leaned into Thoris Dune as a major entity and rewrote his whole story. Oh damn! So the lore of this guy is all over the place, and yet in in some way this adds to the mystique. Um, Thoris Dune is a power powerful god bent on destroying reality itself. Okay. Some stories say he is responsible for the birth of the abyss and for all of demon kind. Ooh. Some say he was born in the far realm or a universe that predates the current one. All lore agrees, though, that he was imprisoned eternally by his fellow deities, both good and evil alike. He is known as the Dark God, the Ender, He of Eternal Darkness, the Chained God, and the Chained Oblivion. He is the God of Madness, Entropy, and Eternal Darkness. He is Theris done with all of your fucking bullshit. He's yes, gonna change exactly. it all. Exactly. He's Theris done with this reality. <laughs> um, previous to fourth edition, Theris Dune's defining feature was his enigmaticness. His origins uh, were full of uh, hearsay and mystery. His origins were unclear. Rumors of his creation have been connected to the Far Realm, as I said earlier. Some previous universe, as I said earlier. His temples, often in the shape of black ziggurats, were said to be extremely hidden and often uh, often due to necessity. Though agreed on all accounts to be eternally imprisoned due to his desire and apparent ability to destroy all things, the details of said imprisonment are not so agreed upon. Some sources say that a great battle took place between Thar's Dune and those, oppo- those that opposed his evil. Unable to destroy him, his enemies were strong enough to overcome his power and imprison him, though. Uh, somewhere by means none have ever been able to discover. Okay. Yeah, that, that's the whole thing with him. Like, oh, but no one knows. No one knows. <laughs> Thus, Thar's Dune disappeared from the face of the Earth and from all other known planes and has not been seen again since. This is like a deity that is uh, sort of kind of reminding me of like Acerak and um, the other guy. Uh, Vecna? Vecna. The, like the secrecy, the, the mystique. Except yeah. in the lore, they detail some of it for you. Whereas this is kind of like, here's a little bit, but beyond that, like, the, yeah. the whole point is no one knows. And yeah, and another another difference, too, is like Vecna and Acerek are specifically being secretive. Mm-hmm. Thar's Dune is being kept a secret by okay. other people. Nice. Yeah. Interesting. So some sources are more specific, saying Thar's Dune was imprisoned eons ago by 
the forgotten beings known as the great powers. Others say that Pelor, god of the sun, was primarily involved. Okay. While others claim that both good and evil deities work together to ensure his imprisonment, but his prison is not foolproof and may weaken at times, allowing his influence to creep out into the worlds beyond. These great powers, have we talked about them before? Not really, because there's not much to talk about. It's kind of like t- <laughs> trying to talk about the, the dark powers from the Shadow uh, Fell. Like, okay. There's just, they exist maybe, and they do things sometimes, and no one knows. So it's more like... Uh, I don't know if you remember the dark powers. Kind of. Uh, like when they, you really they turn need, Shroud into a vampire? Yeah, it, yeah. When you really need something to happen yeah. uh, in your campaign, and you don't know what to chalk it up to, there are the great powers. Yeah, exactly. So is that kind of what we're looking at here? Kinda, Same thing with the dark I, powers? I'm sure maybe they're more detailed in Greyhawk lore that I don't know about, because I'm not a Greyhawk person. <laughs> so they, were, they were like, we need to write uh, Barovia, but it needs a bad guy. Um, okay, dark, <laughs> dark powers. powers. Yeah, exactly. Welcome, to, welcome, Strahd, to the campaign. <laughs> so finally, some sources name his prison to be the demiplane of imprisonment. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> which is hidden somewhere in the depths of the ethereal plane, uh, resembling a swollen crystalline cyst nearly a mile in diameter. All right. The ethereal substance surrounding the Nemi plane boils with the dreamscapes of Tharsdun's worshippers and others whose dream who dreams the dark god invades. Whose dreams the dark god invades. I see. He yeah. invades people's dreams. He's kind of <laughs> like Freddy Krueger in that way. I Freddy guess. Krueger or uh, Dark Rye. Sure. Or Dark Rye. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually a lot like Dark Ride. Thar's dude is Dark Ride. Thar's dude is Dark Ride. <laughs> Within no, the pre- oh, go ahead. Uh, nobody knows where he came from. Do we know where Dark Ride came from? I have no idea where Dark Ride came nobody from. Nobody knows. There, knows. there it is, yeah, and everybody's is. keeping it a secret. Like I have a dark Pokemon. <laughs> okay, go for so it. So within the prison, Thar's dude dreams of a multiverse where his goals succeeded, where he destroyed all of creation and rebuilt it in his own foul image. Dope. The, the binding magic that holds him is less aimed with preventing his escape, which apparently he could accomplish with ease should he ever discover the truth of his false dreams but instead to prevent any outside source from informing him that his dreams are false what (laughs) (laughs) okay now that's just that lore like again there's other lore that says other things okay but that's that's one processing this still i know it's a lot (laughs) okay go for it so his cult is dedicated to awakening him uh Sure. They, they've learned to disguise their true nature by pretending to be worshippers of a false elemental deity called the Elemental Eye. Mm-hmm. The cult came to be known as the Cult of the Elemental Evil, and this is not to be confused with Zuckmoy's Cult of Elemental Evil. <laughs> <laughs> they show up uh, to the fucking gang fight with the same jackets on. <laughs> I know, right? No, it, uh, no, I'm not joking here. Same name, the cult, same name, same temple. Different time, different cult. Yeah, which one came first? Because that's who made too many jackets. Zuckmoy. Yeah, she made way too many elemental evil jackets. And then Thera's doing his cult came in and was like, well, these are a discount on sale. So, and that's a dope name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, I know this is confusing, but let's move on. I want a biker jacket that says elemental evil on it. Yeah, and it has a big eye on it. Actually, I would buy that. <laughs> that's pretty yeah, chill. that would be cool. Okay, so 4E Blessed Soul comes at the topic with hard-to-find facts and overly detailed knowledge of the rise and fall of the chain god. The story of Thar's Dune and Fori starts with the Oberyns. Uh, we talked about them in the Abyss episode. Yeah. The original demons in most D&D lore. In 4E, they are a little different, too. And um, if you're ready, let me tell you the tale. Story time. Story, story corner. Story corner. Little story corner. Get ready, everybody. Let's go. Let's go. Music stinger. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> So the oldest myths and legends tell of a race of vile entities that once presided over the remains of a dying universe. These beings of evil incarnate were known as the Oberiths, and they had ruled since time immemorial. As their hunger drained their realm of all life and power, they knew their days were numbered. So it was that in the last age of their race, the Oberiths breached the barrier between their realm and another, pushing a shard of uttermost evil through the fissure between realities. With the power of the Shard, they hope to corrupt the most powerful beings of this new realm. After bending and eventually enslaving these creatures to their will, the Oberth plan to exert their control over a new realm, reshaping it in their own vile image. Eons passed as the Oberth slowly died. When only a handful of their kind remained, the plan they had enacted so long ago finally came to fruition. A deity hungry for power found and seized the Shard of Evil. This god, Thera's Dune, found his mind and spirit open to the Oberths trapped in their dying darkness. The link to those foul beings corrupted him in an instant, driving the deity to madness. But the Oberth's plan to seize the celestial realms controlled by Thera's Dune and his kind was met with resistance and a twist they had not anticipated. The Oberths demanded that the deity plant the seed of evil within the Astral Sea, promising him total dominion of that realm in exchange for his fealty. Ooh. 
Even within his madness, however, Tharzun recognized that his fellow gods would turn on him before he could fully seize the power of the Oberons promised. Instead, the mad god traveled to the furthest regions of the cosmos, planting the seed of evil in the primordial expanse of the churning elemental chaos, mm. the realm of the fallen primordials from the Dawn War, which he had hoped to seize as, as his own. So the planting of the seed of evil in the elemental chaos unleashed power like that realm had never seen before. Uh, the nascent evil of the Oberon's realm flared one last time as black flame exploding through a yawning vortex that formed where the seed was cast down. Me. Forced... <laughs> First, <laughs> I just see like this, like Earth Elemental. Neat, nice. <laughs> Forced to act, even though their plans had gone astray, the Oberons allowed themselves to be drawn through the vortex as their own realm was consumed and finally destroyed. The Oberons had seemingly won their prize, a realm in which their evil could be spawned anew. But as the tear in the fabric of reality closed, Zara's Doom betrayed and faced off against his would-be masters. The evil and madness of the Shard blessed Zara's Doom with great power of his own. The vortex that formed around the Shard of Evil was the abyss, growing within the elemental chaos, even as Zara's Doom and the Oberons fought to control it. You're like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> In a battle that raged for eons, Thera's Doom tore through the stuff of the nascent abyss, following the shard of evil and calling forth minions from its burgeoning substance. The first demons howled in fury at their creator's command, throwing themselves at the Oberons with wave after wave of, su of suicide. The Shard of Evil had granted the Mad God far more power than the Oberons could have ever predicted. Instead of a puppet, they faced a being of unmatched strength and absolute evil. Only by working together did the last 12 Oberons stave off destruction, and over the course of endless battles, forced Sars Dune into a stalemate. As both sides withdrew to plot the other's destruction, the growth of the Abyss settled and slowed. Beings outside the newly created realm took notice of it for the first time. Drawn by whispers promising power and dominion over the unfolding realms of creation, the first primordials entered the abyss. The shattered realm they observed within the vortex was thoroughly corrupted, but these creatures were unconcerned with morality as they pressed on, beckoned by the whispering of the abyss's evil heart. As they explored further into the desolation, they came upon a great blood-red ocean, and they knew they had reached that heart at last, floating there in the shallows of the nascent. You know, this story really likes the word nascent, and I don't think I've ever heard, uh, heard that word used before. Yeah, I, uh, I would have Googled it, because yeah. I was like, hey, I should jump in and read some of this for Will. Yeah. I don't know what that word is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting context clues, yeah. though. Yeah, shallows of the nascent blood sea. The shard of evil called out for one strong enough to step forward and claim it. These primordials became the first of the demon lords. The intrusion of these new demon lords into the abyss pushed Thorazun to act. He attempted to force them and their ilk into slavery, but their combined power proved too great for him. Ra rather than risk defeat in single combat, Thorazun strove to marshal the remaining power of the elemental chaos and its denizens in its bid for universal domination. The, prim the primordials there, already angered with the gods meddling in the affairs of the world from the Dawn War, were easily swayed by Thorazun's call, call to arms. They believed that if the Mad God could reclaim the Shard of Evil now buried in the heart of the Abyss, it would ensure their triumph over the gods of the Astral Sea. Calling himself the Elder Elemental Eye, Thorazun attracted powerful followers, only a few of which knew him as the god he was. The deceit he fomented rallied other elemental creatures to his banner, and the cult of the elemental evil grew. But the attention of the gods had finally been drawn. Um, oh, shit, I just lost my voice. To the newly made it, abyss. To the newly made abyss and the primordials that entered it. When Thursdun's plans were discovered, his immortal kin, good and evil alike, rallied and attacked. Though a powerful shit. foe, Thursdun was overcome by the combined might of the gods. Locking him away in a remote abyssal lair, they called him the Chain God and struck his name from history. Thursdun's armies were scattered over time. He was forgotten. Thera's doing his Exodia. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's something, all right. He um, draws five pieces, you win the game. I know. And uh, with that, let's take a short rest. I think we should. <laughs> okay. Hey, everybody, be sure to check out Super, Super Quest, Quest Saga. Saga, a future fantasy 5th edition D&D actual play podcast from Brood and Dungeon Mastered by yours truly, me, and Set in Space. And I play in it, along with your special guest, Jake, and friend of the show, Josh Freeland. You can find it on YouTube, iTunes, or anywhere else you can get your podcasts. Super Quest Saga. We've returned. Indeed we have. We're back. Back to the roiling darkness. That There's is done Dune. with this short rest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So few visual attempts to depict Thar's Dune exist, but the texts speak of a creature of ro rolling hunger, 
Rolling hungry ink and darkness, a spreading cloud of lightless destruction born from a thousand ravenous mouths. The Langoliers. <laughs> the Langoliers. Um, <laughs> Shout out to Comic Pop for always talking about the Langoliers. <laughs> I know, right? Current references show the nightmare constrained by chains of gold and black, barely keeping the dark at bay. Gary Gygax described Darius Dune as a primordial deity that of matter at rest and decay of energy, an incorporeal wraith form, black and faithless. Faceless. You know, because uh, Theris Dune at rest stays at rest. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Gygax described Theris Dune's avatar in his gourd, the rogue novel, Come Endless Darkness, as a huge, bald, humanoid man with claws, greenish-black skin, and pointed ears. But officially, none truly know, for contact with the, de- with the deity brings insanity and death, and no accurate surviving descriptions or depictions of him remain. That's a really Halloween-y, you know, like, kind of... Yeah, old school very, goblin. Very uh, cheesy. Yeah, yeah like yeah. green skin. And there's know. a lot about like the art and depiction of stuff in first edition that was very, very cheesy. Yeah, I've seen some of the drawings, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, like very uh, gothic in- inspired stuff mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. like classic inspired stuff like Mary Shelley or um, mm-hmm. what what else does it remind me of? Um, just like that classic, like a hag has that timeless Halloween-y yeah, sort, of, that, uh, sort of description. Folk tale kind of nursery rhyme. Grim yeah, Brothers kind of. Yeah, yeah. this stuff definitely carries that sort of weight but there's no like nostalgic base for me so Mm -hmm. it seems corny but also like if i saw that it would freak me the fuck out like beyond you know regular skin it's green skin like oh shit if that was for reals though i'd be scared yeah since it's not for reals i'm like that's cheap so, <laughs> so his aspect of the el- elder elemental eye, however, has been witnessed by cultists and adventurers alike. It is described as a huge model tentacled being or as a pillar of vast elemental force with a body of burning magma radiating steam. Mm. How often it is able to manifest as an avatar depends more on the waxing and waning of planar influences than its own will or the rituals of its priests, though. It has been known to manifest itself as permanent phenomena in its oldest temples, including energy-draining tentacles emerging from altars and glowing golden eyes that cause blindness, madness, premature age, or transforming into eggs that hatch into berserk salamanders, which is very different from those first four co- uh, effects. Yeah, th- I like this idea. <laughs> I might blind you, turn you mad, make you old, or turn you in an egg that hatches into a berserk salamander. I'm stuck on this <laughs> waxing and waning of the planar influences. Yes, like a, I like, like that. Um, a divination wizard or like these priests like reading those charts would be kind of cool. Yeah. They're like, oh, fuck, the fire plane is really close right now. Right, exactly. The fucking the elemental plane of air is in retrograde. We're all fucked. <laughs> I like that. I like doing like a, an almost astrology type thing with the planes. Yeah. Okay, so when it comes to who there's doing is as a person or character, there isn't a lot to work with. Yeah, the mystique is for real. Yeah. It's laid on thick. Mm-hmm. He is in some ways a one-dimensional force of nature, while in other ways has similarities with Lovecraftian deities in that he is mad beyond comprehension, beyond, beyond morality, and capable of all-encompassing calamity. Sure, but with, he's chained up and can't. Yeah, exactly. With every fiber of his being, Thurs doing creates nothing less than the unmaking of the universe, destroying everything, himself included, in the process. He, he is darkness <laughs> unending, less like a god and more like another world unto himself. Life and death do not exist within the Ars Dune, only utter destruction and madness. Even the most vile and chaotic evil among the gods treat this mad god with caution. Yeah, because if he wins, he's going to Kirby the universe up into his mouth, and then mm-hmm. his body's going to fold around his mouth. He's going to become yep. like a tiny little it's, lip pile. Maybe Kirby is the Ars Dune. <laughs> the, the Kirby skin where he's got like the black and white complexion with <laughs> yeah, the yellow feet. Exactly. That's the Ars Dune. Yeah, exactly. His mouth gets way bigger, though. <laughs> so believe it or not, despite Thurs Dune being a well-kept secret on a cosmological scale, so much so that his name was stricken from any historical record, and despite him having the one all-consuming intention of utter universal annihilation, he still has cultists that are picking up what he's laying down. Nice. <laughs> what are these historical records that he's being struck from? Are they like stone tablets or books? Well, the idea here is that he uh, was imprisoned so long ago, it's in time immemorial, so basically whatever was around then, and then any word of him showing up, there are paladins and you'd be <laughs> orders that are dedicated to utterly annihilating them. It's just some fucking Templars going through the sacred original text, mm-hmm. like fuck there is Dune. Yeah, Shh, exactly. Ripping pages out. <laughs> we can't yeah, that. <laughs> we gotta burn this whole book, dog. I'm yeah. sorry you took so long <laughs> writing it. It's got a lot of Theris Dune. <laughs> I can almost like... see it getting crazy. It's like, oh, we found a book about Theris Dune in this temple. We gotta burn the whole city to the ground. Oh, oh, yeah, I could see it going. Who read far. this book? Yeah, who read they this they book? look at the library checkout log. They're like, fuck, there's so <laughs> many people. Uh-huh. Well, they're all dead. Yeah. So Thursday's direct worshippers are often insane. Their <laughs> ultimate goal is to free their dark deity from his prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, like 
his lay worshipers, many of the Arzun's priests, are mad as well. And though, and those who are not mad believe that they will reap great rewards and privileges for their aid in freeing him. They hold the optimistic and idiotic belief that he will spare his loyal servants when he destroys the multiverse. Like, why would you think that? Why? Yeah, why would you think that? I mean, according to this, he explicitly wants to unravel all of all it. Things. But they're in, they're insane, and that's what yeah. an insane person would think. They're like, right. I'm going to be chill when he destroys everything. Right, right. <laughs> I'm just going to be floating in yeah. whatever is left. You know who's a Tharzun worshiper? Um, Cyrus from uh, Platinum. Pokemon oh, I thought, Platinum. I thought he you wants gonna, to undo reality. I thought you were going to call out like a rival YouTuber or something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that other podcast. Fuck that other podcast. Ah. The Stars Dune Worshippers. No, we like all you guys. Yeah. We got some people to shout out. Don't let me forget. Yeah, I won't. Okay. So all of his clerics are extremely secretive and trust only fellow cultists. His temples, often in the shape of black ziggurats, are usually hidden due to necessity. Many work together to bring together all of his artifacts, of which there are many, to one location in order to free the Ebon God from his imprisonment. Cool. Okay. It is said that the rites his cults perform are unspeakable, even by the standards of other evil deities and they seek out new forms of magic whenever they can. Tharzun is also knowingly worshipped by non-human aberrations such as Abolus, Neogi, and Grell. Now, the fact that his cultists speak, uh, like perform acts that are unspeakable by the standards of other evil deities really makes me wonder because we talked about some crazy shit in the Zuckmoy episode. And like Inagu and like those guys? Yeah. Like, well, well, to be well, fair, how, I guess they aren't gonna... deities though. They are demons. Uh, yeah. That's true. So I mean, maybe. they're like almost deities, right? They're, they're kind of oh, close. Set, yeah. Like they're kind of close to minor deity though. But if they're doing stuff that's so horrible and they're not even gods. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. Yeah, how, know. Worse, how much worse can it get? Is unraveling the reality something I'm going to experience? You know, like is that I something I'm going to feel? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't this know. This might be the way to go. If it's going to end, Maybe this might this be the, the way- best way to end it. The, the best Oh, apo- no. There's We're Dune's converting. Got the, <laughs> there's Dune's got the best apocalypse. <laughs> so on top of this, many cults and individual cultists are unaware that the entity they worship even is Thar's Dune. Unable to act upon the world directly, he dispenses his power from cover identities and aspects such as the Elder Elemental Eye, responsible for the infamous Temple of Elemental Evil. And though the cult's leaders are usually... <laughs> I was going to say, like, they probably think it's Zuckton. <laughs> they do! Yeah, they do. Sometimes. <laughs> the yeah. fucking jackets are back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And although the cult's leaders are usually fully aware of their patron's true identity, many low-ranking members merely seek revenge against society or are unaware with the full... Ex- uh, unaware of the full extent of the Dark God's destruction, should he be freed. So they're thinking like, oh yeah, this dude's going to cleanse the world. They're not thinking like, oh, he's going to undo like every atom in the universe. Right. Yeah. Like, like this is going to be, so, they don't even know who it is. It's like, Zugtumoy is so chill. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a bunch of Thayer's Dune worshippers <laughs> that just have no fucking clue what they're even doing. Yeah. They're just doing it though. That's how it goes. Obviously they're failing. Yes, very mm, much so. Idiots. <laughs> a bunch of dumbasses. So... Uh, this is not to say the unwitting followers of their student alter egos are much better in intent or alignment. Worshippers of the ele- Elder Elemental Eye envision a future where the world has been consumed utterly by elemental chaos. Floods, earthquakes, lava, and destructive winds destroying civilization until only the faithful survive. Okay. Cultists of the element of the Elder Elemental God, a.k.a. actually of the Ars Dune, work to free their imprisoned master, rediscover lost shrines, and sacrifice sentient beings to attract more of their master's power, including their own flocks or themselves. So they think this is like the book of Genesis is going to break break it all down? I guess so. Kind of like that? Yeah, right. sure. They seek out places of elemental power throughout the world, which they transform into elemental nodes using special rituals. They wear ochre robes and blazon with their deity symbol. Some of the ice priests dedicate themselves to a specific elemental aspect, while others emphasize all elements simultaneously. Which I think is funny because you know he doesn't give a fuck about elements. Like, <laughs> like he's just like that's not his brand. But he's literally like, copying this brand off exactly, somebody else. Yeah. Those that helps who, them be mysterious. Right. Those who worship the air aspect trim their robes with white. Those who worship earth aspect trim their robes in yellow and wear amulets festooned with gems and precious metals. Those who worship the fire aspect trim their robes with red and carry jewelry enchanted with continual flame. While those who worship the water aspect trim their robes in deep blue and often carry small jugs filled with seawater. This is so arbitrary. I know. Can you imagine dealing with all these guys and yeah. then figuring it out at the yeah, end that they're all fucking this dumb? all bullshit. Oh, yeah. man. Those forgotten temples of Darzun that survive are in dark underground places kept freezing cold by ancient magic placed by the fanatics who built them. They made they make heavy use of black stone and an archaic trapezoidal building pattern. Newer temples to Thar's Dune exist in the abandoned buildings of cities, disused sewer chambers, and the cellars of converts. A uh, few operate more openly in remote wilderness areas where the locals are too few and too cowardly to challenge them. Man, 
This dude, <laughs> this dude's followers are fucking hilarious. Yeah, they're, this is comedy. they're really extra. Yeah, so Thurston's exact dogma is unknown. As the, as the ages he was imprisoned in the abyss along with his own growing insanity left him unable to communicate in any meaningful <laughs> manner with his worshippers. He's getting better. Yeah, even when he has managed to appear to his followers, he's only spoke spoken to them in the form of shrieking babble that was impossible for mortals to comprehend and left all who witnessed it insane. Or he's like... It's either that or he's like, nice jacket, dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> so all cults of the Dark God come up with their own dogma to follow. Tharzun's followers are united by one single ancient creed found inscribed within one of his dark pyramids. Light must be snuffed, perfection decayed, order dissolved, and minds fragmented. Okay. Which doesn't seem like a great thing to follow, but whatever. <laughs> you can't be you can't work here unless you're crazy. Right. Most cults also follow these tenets. Channel power to the chain god so he can break his chains. Mm. Retrieve lost relics and shrines to the train, chain god. Pursue the obliteration of the world in, in anticipation of the chain god's liberation. All right. The rest of his religion consists of sporadic collection of terrible holy texts, secretly guarded even from other sects, and detailing terrible rituals and extra planar horrors. Okay, so these these are the types of texts that we talk about that can uh, opening one the right person opening one up and reading it can spiral a whole chain of events. Yeah, can absolutely. Birth this whole plot. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So as a, so as I said before, Thurs Dune has quite the number of unholy artifacts floating about. His cult possesses numerous of them, along with lesser magic items sacred to the Dark God, and devotes considerable resources to finding more. Even fragments of destroyed artifacts are priceless to the cult, since clerics cannot receive spells from Thurs Dune without being in proximity to such an artifact. Many items crafted more recently are etched with Thurs Dune's holy symbol, the Dark Spiral. Okay. So here are a few of Thar's Dune's infamous artifacts. The first is The Lament for Lost Thar's Dune. Uh, it's a book bound in black scaly hide written in silver ink on black paper. Merely reading this text is damaging to the mind of any but the mad followers of Thar's Dune. It's presumed to have been written by one of his followers after the deity's banishment. Okay. Is it like a how-to on how to be insane? Doesn't say. It seems that way. Yeah, sure. The next is the Spear of Sorrow, a crisp pole arm seven feet in length and carved entirely from black stone. Its purpose is to locate and restore the god's ancient and forgotten temples and awaken his sleeping guardians. It's for locate and restore. Is it like a key then? It seems like a... I don't know. <laughs> it seems more useful than the I think. I, I think you use it... Uh, you you look for Thar's Dune temples that have been lost and forgotten and you bring the spear there. And the, Yeah, okay. And then it wakes shit up. And anybody you stab on the way gets visibly sad. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, kind of like what that's like Grotz's sword. I think that's called Sorrow Weaver or something like that. Sorrow oh, Weaver. Have I made this joke? Yeah, you made this exact joke <laughs> about that. <Yeah. laughs> Whoops. It's going to happen. <laughs> so uh, the next artifact is Druniazth, the Claw of Dara's Dune. It's a sword made from black ruinite metal by cultist centuries after his banishment. Its purpose is to spread a prophecy of Thar's Dune's return and ultimately to unleash him upon the world. Okay. The next is the Weeping Hexagram. Um, <laughs> discovered near a holy site called the Ziggurat of Black, it is a 10-foot diameter black iron ring inset with a bowed hexagram which seeps blood when exposed to sunlight. Oh, uh, what? That's so weird. <laughs> so it's just gross. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I'm going to throw this one out, dude. It keeps leaking. Yeah. The next is the 333 Gems of Thar's Dune, okay. a collection of gemstones sacred to the Dark One, sacrificed to him by cultists in ages past. Mostly looted or sold off after Thar's Dune's imprisonment, they have spread across the world by traders unaware of their connection to that evil deity. Yikes. There's a lot of them. Yeah. Lots just, of those. Just some rocks. Some <laughs> old, I used to like collecting rocks before they chained me up. <laughs> so how powerful is Thar's Dune really? It's not clear. Some sources have him at lesser or intermediate deity level, while others have him as able to undo the cosmos uh, power level. I think the general idea here is that Thurzun is not is the only entity with a real actual chance of uniting the entire abyss under a sway if broken free. An abyss united under one banner would undoubtedly overwhelm the entire cosmos. But that's just my take on the chain god. Well, he obviously needs his arms and legs to to do the stuff he needs to do. Well, yeah, or he's sure. done it up by now. Yeah, so he's somewhere in between. Yeah, uh, well, also to, to, to get out of the demiplane that he's stuck into. Right, yeah. I mean, you got to climb. You got to physically. Yeah. It's it's like the uh, the pit in Dark Knight Rises. He's like, uh, sure. You know, <laughs> there's just got a broken back. So you got any questions about Thor's Dune? I have a lot of questions, but not, <laughs> he's clearly not going to answer <laughs> That's them. That's true, yeah. yeah. 
is this is this is cool. It's like a, a pseudo Lovecraftian. Yeah, almost. exactly. It very much reminds very me of a specific, a uh, very specific Lovecraftian deity. Well, I'm so tired. Yeah, is it time to get ready for a, a long rest? Yeah, let's do it. That's that was the thing I was setting up. Okay, let's do <laughs> let's it. Do it. <laughs> uh, William, it's time for the long rest, and we find ourselves getting ready for bedtime and putting on our slippies. And this week, will mm-hmm. uh, my slippies have the eye of elemental evil? inscribed upon them oh nice um i ordered them off etsy uh-huh and i think the the person on etsy is confu- confused oh, on which know. elemental eye i wanted because this one's got little mushrooms on, oh like no. kind of growing out the toes <laughs> no you got the yeah. Zep Moy one they smell so bad i'm sure they do i also another joke i <laughs> wanted to make uh was i thought i like the theresden lore where this rock or whatever is like you know just uh what do you call it like just sh- sh- rocketing across birthing planes of the abyss. That's kind of how I imagine it. Am I getting that right? Oh, you're talking about the evil shark? The evil shark. Not, not really. <laughs> that's why the abyss smells so bad, because it's just an evil shark. Oh, that's so gross. Um, no, it's it's basically just this sliver of pure evil in shard form. And uh, Got that. When it got slipped through one reality into the other, um, and Darzun got his hand, hands on it, he plunged it into the elemental chaos and it birthed the abyss. And that's what it's doing. So it, yeah. it kind of and like the abyss is growing from the. So it's shard. like a it's like that's a, fourth edition specific lore. Though. It's like a master master sword pedestal, but it's just yeah. got this shard in it, and yeah. it's making every every layer smell so bad. Yeah, so bad. Cool. All right, that's good. Cleared that up. Cool. Um, you have one day, people of Indeed. people of the dungeon cast. Final day. Um, we got it's a dawn of going. the final day. Yes, twenty four hours remain. Mm-hmm. Uh, or less probably because this is coming out at four o'clock. You got yeah. like twelve eight hours, hours, dog. It's like eight hours. You got eight hours, dog. You might have <laughs> six hours, dog. I don't know where you live. Um, speaking of that, thank you to all the people that listen to us in other countries like Germany, yes. Australia, thank you, and thank you. Sweden, mm-hmm. and and anywhere really. Um, we we have listeners from all over the globe. Shout out to y'all. Indeed. You are not barred from our contest as long as we can like figure out some way to ship a book to you. Right, we will um, try and figure out. We just got a, a prize to someone in oh god, I don't even remember what C. country. C. Started with a C. L. What was it? It was somewhere in Eastern Europe. Yeah, and, and, and they requested that we purchase from a local game store to mm-hmm. have it. And it worked to them. out. It worked and out really well. That's great. We love supporting the local game store. I mean, we will usually zon for the use the zon and Jeff Bezos, the powers mm-hmm. of just. Jeff Bezos to um, <laughs> to send Jeff stuff Bezos. effectively and efficiently, yes. yeah. but um, we would rather support a local game store. So yeah. if you guys, uh, if we reach out to you and that's what you want, um, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together. So if you're in another country, we'll work with you. You know. That being Don't worry said, about it. Uh, back to the contest. Uh, we are giving away a copy of oh, two copies, two copies of two Tasha's co- Cauldron of Everything. One for our Twitter followers and the other for our Instagram followers. That's correct. If you want to get in on this contest, you got just today to do it. All you got to do is uh, tweet out a link to an uh, episode of one of our shows. It could be any of our shows. It could be Dungeons & Dragons Explained in 5 Minutes. It could be The Dungeon Cast. It could be Super Quest Saga. But just make sure you do that with the hashtag Dungeon Cast, and you'll be entered to win. I'll be pulling a name on December 1st. Or go to Instagram. Find the rules on there. Uh, you know what's up. I'm not going to keep explaining it at the end of every episode. I think we should just say go to the go to our social media pages and follow us there. It would help us out. And um, spreading the word about the show is what these contests are all about. We really uh, appreciate it. We see when you guys talk about the show to others, and it really does help. Word of mouth is super powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, like uh, any good cult, uh, the amassing following uh, brings success and power to the deity. Mm-hmm. So shout mm-hmm. out to Dima Gorgon. Which I just, I'm just kind of doing those whenever I want now. Yeah, I know. Uh, is it liberating? That's it how much like more powerful I am. <laughs> At first, it was kind of felt like something was making me do it. And now I just <laughs> kind of feel like I want to do it all the oh, time. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. I, wasn't there a long time where we like wouldn't do it? Yeah. I, don't, I barely well, remember that anymore. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, man. Seems like so times. long ago. Uh, <laughs> that being said, we have a lot of patrons to shout out because our, our schedule got messed up by it some did. technical stuff. It did. But um, I'm going to pull that up. All right. All right, I found it. We're going to go right. one at a time here, Will, so be patient with me. Okay. Um, so thank you for your pledge, Mason Rodine. Thank you, Mason. Uh, thank you for your pledge, Timmy. Thank you, Timmy. It's T-I-M-M-E-H, so I said it like that. Okay. Fun right. South Park style. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Steve Zdanswick. Thank you, Steve. It's literally Z-D. Mm. Um, so I did my best. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me scroll here. Uh, thank you, Gareth Deacon. Thank you, Gareth. And let me scroll here. Ah, yes. Thank you, Lupercio, Baron of Sloth. 
Thank you, Lupercio, Baron of Sloth. It's probably more like Lupercio. Oh, that sounds kind of cool. It's yeah. L U P E R C I O. Lupercio. Baron of Sloth is pretty easy to read. Yeah, that's true. Uh, thank you, Paul Sorensen. Thank you, Paul. All right. So that, uh, that brings us to the Nov, which is to say November. Mm -hmm. Let me scroll hella far to find that. Thanks, Patreon. There's probably a list of this somewhere. I just don't know how to get it. Um, yeah, if you go to Relationship Manager, you should be able to organize patrons by time pledged. Son of a bitch. I'm in the clunky, like, notifications yeah, bar. Yeah, I think. Well, well it's, I'll show you. It's I'll telling you me by that. date. I wonder if the notifications is what's making it miss people because it's not logging them all. It's like kind of sporadic. Yeah, it's quite possible. Anyway, um, thank you. Those were for our October shout outs. So you guys waited a while. I appreciate you. Indeed. Um, so next up we have Andrew Zembruk. Thank you, Andrew. It's an SZ. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so uh, cool. Travis S. Thank you, Travis. Ah, Odd Vascar. Thank you, Odd Vascar. Mm, Draven Golden. Thank you, Draven. Maybe it's Draven. Like Thank Raven you, Draven. with a D in front of it. Oh gosh. Um, this one is I. There's spaces in. Nope. There's spaces in between two of these. It's I space R space T P. Thank you, IRTP. It's all caps. Mm -hmm. Thank you, IRTP. Uh, thank you, Nick Farrell. Thank you, Nick. Who we've surely shouted out before. So welcome sure, yeah. back, Nick. It's always good to have you, Nick Farrell. <laughs> uh, let's see here. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Baka Senpai 69. Thank you, Baka Senpai 69. <laughs> uh, thank you, Emmanuel Laplante. Thank you, Emmanuel. Or Laplante. I'm not sure. Thank you. There's an E there. Yes. At the end, you know? Uh huh. Um, let's keep going here. Uh, thank you, Riverside Odds. Thank you, Riverside Odds. Ah, uh, yes. Thank you, uh, Lawrence Pilo. Thank you, Lawrence. Beep, 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 beep. I usually throw one of those in there. Yeah, I know you do. Uh, <laughs> uh, and thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Christopher. Christopher! <laughs> All powerful, Christopher. <laughs> the latest pledge. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about Patreon while we're here. And yes. this is long anyway. Yeah. But um, you want an ad-free version of the show? We got you. Five bucks a month, baby. Come and get them early, too. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They drop in batches. You know, our, our show airs weekly. Yeah. We record in batches. You're going to get the batch the earliest we can possibly get them to you. Yeah. So you get some Dungeon Cast potentially weeks early. Then you're going to wait for everybody to catch up. And then you're going to get a big chunk early again. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. What um, what else? At... at at, uh, at 10, you get all our other bonus content that's like an actual play you can listen to. Mm -hmm. Plus, you're going to get a sticker if you put in your address. Mm -hmm. You get a sticker sent to you of our po podcast thumbnail, which is currently You're the Giant. It's about to change. Keep your eye on that. Mm -hmm. uh, next is the $20 level. You're going to get our exclusive mug, which has just changed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It says Indeed. Yeah. The first of those should start arriving, I think, at the end of December or beginning of January, somewhere in there. Pretty soon here. Yeah. Um, and then after that, it's just icing on the cake for us. Um, we try to do some special stuff in there. You get uh, exclusive access to uh, a channel in our Discord mm -hmm. where we do special giveaways, Secret Santa's coming up. Get in there, get your Secret Santa on. Mm -hmm. Make sure you get that code uh, for the Discord. And then um, content drops into a, uh, a Google Drive. So you can get episode notes and stuff like that. It's all really organized. It took a lot of time to do that. Um, but we still, we'll still drop most stuff on the Patreon feed. So mm -hmm. I know there's like a special RSS feed yeah. that will load with whatever, whatever podcatcher you use, you should be getting those early drops. Those early episodes should just show up in your normal podcast feed, but go to, go to patreon.com slash the dungeon cast. Check it out. Um, supporting us monthly is, you know, aside from telling people about the show, that's one of the best things you can do to help the dungeon cast. Yeah. Um, it, it really does make a difference in our lives and helps yeah. us grow yeah. and makes us feel like what we do is, uh, is really like meaningful to people and impactful that you guys are willing to support us and you know mm -hmm. that's kind of stuff so we, we want to reach out and do stuff for our patrons as much as we can um so that's pretty much the deal man support us monthly we'll do what we can to get content in there mm -hmm. and to make you feel so special the way you make us feel so special <laughs> indeed um so thanks for powering up demon gorgon with us indeed thank you uh we're gonna call it a game indeed we are we'll talk to you guys next week bye Dungeon Cast.